Hello and welcome to The Print. Uh, we're joined here uh, with the president of Sri Lanka, Mr. Ranul Wickremesinghe, on the cusp of an incredibly decisive election. It's been two years since uh, a popular uprising and an economic crisis toppled the former um, president, paving the way for Mr. Wickremesinghe to take over and try to lead Sri Lanka to the path of economic recovery. Um, so my first question is, what is at stake if you lose the election? How will the economic health of Sri Lanka be affected? What is at stake is not about me, about the future of the people and future of the country. They have to decide what is best for their future. I took over at a time when no one else was willing to take over the government. I think it's history. I have made a record because this is the first time in the world that the prime ministership went begging. The leader of the opposition refused, the leaders of other parties refused. I came in because I felt the economy could be rescued. We should do it and the people should not suffer. <clears throat> so it's a unique occasion. I formed a government with members of different parties, some of them who have been criticizing me all the time. And we've now been able to stabilize the economy and come to an agreement with the IMF, uh, with the official creditors, 17 in the official creditors committee. 18th being the China Development Bank. We've com uh, completed the agreement with China Development Bank early today, yesterday night or early today morning. And we've also come to an agreement today with the, uh, official, the, with the bondholder, the private bondholder. In another hour or two, a statement will be issued in Singapore. So we've come to a position that I've come to all the agreements which will lead the way to uh, Sri Lanka, uh, debt being declared as sustainable, and thereafter we will not be required to be a, you know, be called a bankrupt country. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do now is where do we go from here? The opposition wants to renegotiate it, but if we go to renegotiate it, <coughs> then we will not uh, be able to get the next few tranches from the IMF firstly. Secondly, we have uh, stabilized the economy, but we've got to secure it and we've got to make Sri Lanka an export-oriented economy. Those are the major issues for the future. You have money, then you can develop the country whichever way you want. So the people have got to decide their future, especially young people who will still be alive and kicking in about 25 years' time. Let's actually talk about your competition. Um, the landscape of Sri Lankan politics seems to have really changed since the Aragalaya, the popular uprising in 2022. There seems to be a fracture that's come up. Um, on one hand, you have the National People's Power with JVP at the helm, campaigning to be the system change that the Aragalaya demanded two years ago. On the other hand, we have you who's kind of advocating for continued uh, stability. Um, we also have Mr. Premadasa, who seems to be an extension of the government or, or seen as an extension. How divided is the country? I mean, a third force, the JVP, seems to has risen again. But can it be different from what it promises to be? And where does the SJB fall on the spectrum? Actually, the politics of Sri Lanka broke down with the economy. It is the, it is the politics that sustained the import-oriented import economy, which was unable to pay its way and which also lived on the uh, monies that were uh, borrowed from outside as well as the internal market. So both have collapsed. What we've done is to put the economy back. Mm -hmm. And next election will decide how you put the political system back. All political parties have broken down. And uh, certainly the NPP has tried to gain on the frustrations, especially <coughs> within the opposition, because the SJB didn't play its role as the uh, conventional opposition, the support has now sh has shifted onto the NPP, otherwise there should not be MPP. No leader of the opposition should allow a second person to rise from the ranks to be a rival to them. So that could not be maintained by the SJB. When you have the SLPP, those who who are now put forward Nama Rajapaksa as the candidate. 
but we have a large number of people who are basically with us and it's a sort of a informal alliance which I have come forward as an independent candidate. The system is changing and uh, <clears throat> the JVP offers change in the sense they said give us a chance, we have not been the president, they have been ministers, so give us a chance, it's, it's one of changing faces. I am asking for overall, uh, not a change, but what I call a virtual uh, upheaval of the system, where when you bring in an export-oriented economy, the whole economic structure changes. Then we want to, we are giving <coughs> title to a large number of people who are doing land permits. Two million people will get freehold permits. <coughs> We have upped the social welfare system, that the Women's Empowerment Act that has been passed, that is Social Justice Commission. We are having the anti-corruption agenda. We are having at the base what we call People's Committee, Jan Jana Sabha, uh, representation of women and youth in elected bodies. So all this together will really create an upheaval in the country, an upheaval for the better, not for the worse. So we represent the upheaval groups, the new ones who came together, despite their arrival earlier. And on side are the conventional opposition groups, to which uh, NPP has gathered some more, because the SJB has not been able to bring the numbers together. But like you said, when you put together your government, uh, conventional politics went out the no, window, yeah. right? Um, but why is it that you think Mr. Anurag Kumar is striking such a chord with the people in this current moment? He is striking a chord with some people who are dissatisfied and uh, partly on the situation here, socially and economically, and partly because they feel the SJP has not been an opposition. But uh, I don't think the discord applies to the majority of the country. Hmm. Uh, but still it seems to be a significant youth. Um, All that can be looked at when you count the ballots. Hmm. Um, speaking of, I want to, there seems to be a sort of international sword of sorts hanging over this election. I know that part of the IMF um, um, package was a, a lot of focus on government transparency and transparency of systems. Do you feel a lot of international pressure to steer Sri Lanka through free and fair elections, especially as a, um, that some of our South Asian neighbors seem to be facing the opposite, but also it looks like at this current moment, it looks like you'll have to go for multiple rounds of counting and in the absence of a clear majority. Um, is that something that you're worried about? I don't know if there will be multiple rounds. I, I think it will get decided really, very really quickly because a lot of Sri Lankans don't cast the second vote. So rem remember that. I have no pressure on having free and fair election because I am having free and fair election. There is the least number of complaints, it's quite open, people are quite happy. No one has ever come and uh, spoken to me about free and fair elections, because we are having it. Remember Sri Lanka since 1931 has been a continuous uh, democratic system. There have been no uh, major, we've had issues, but one side has not knocked out the other side completely. And we are used to it, so we are going ahead. I think the people must decide where they want to go now. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about India and China now. Um, Mr. Disnayaka is seen as China friendly, whereas Mr. Premadasa is seen as more India friendly. Where do you think Sri Lanka fits into this uh, geopolitical puzzle and how does Sri Lanka balance both? Well, I am Sri Lanka friendly. So as such, I look after the interest of Sri Lanka, which includes ensuring that uh, we do not allow any harm to India's national security. That has been our policy since 1987 and we've got to uphold it. So we are, we are committed to that. Um, there's an Adani project underway in Sri Lanka. Yeah. I, I, there's an Adani project as well that's underway in Sri yeah. Lanka. Are you open to more economic investments? I yeah. always ask for more economic investments. My vision statement with Prime Minister Modi is for more investments to come. Hmm. Um, Switching gears a little bit, do you think, do you take peace in the North currently as grant, do you take it as granted forever or do you think you've done enough justice um, for the Tamils in the North? What, what you're saying there, whatever, 
Can I repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Um, do you take do you take peace in the north as granted currently? Peace in the north is there. It won't get disrupted. Tamils will not uh, take up to violence. Neither will people from the south. <clears throat> there is more to be done to the north, especially economic development. And I am committed to that. I have already explained in my uh, policy statement or manifest what we are going to do. There is also, I think, a need for the provincial councils, all nine to be up and functioning. And I have suggested more powers to them in the field of economic development. Police powers will have to be discussed in the next parliament. Uh, no, we, we have to do more for the north, more for the east. And there's tremendous potential in the north and the east for the overall economic development of Sri Lanka. We should not treat them as poor provinces. Uh, because enacting the 13th Amendment fully is, is a, is, has found mention in Mr. Premadasa's manifesto. Well, I mean, basically, there are no one who's against the 13th Amendment. I think even JVP has now accepted it. Uh, well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've been telling them about how we are going to implement the 13th Amendment throughout the country. I don't think it should be something special only for the North. Even the Northern politicians agree it should not be only for the North, it should be for the rest of it. So, I don't know why Mr. Premadasa put it only as the North. Uh, he has to be clear where he wants it to be. But I have already stated I want it to be one of the, the nine engines of growth, regional engines of growth, the additional functions we will give them and how they will uh, carry out the activity. Addition to a National Land Commission and National Land Policy Act. So I have been talking about it already. It's already there in my uh, uh, manifesto. I am surprised you are asking me what I am going to do. You know, Again, if you want to earmark it, then send it to you. <laughs> you know, you've come through a very uh, difficult and violent period um, in Sri Lankan history. You're one of the originals. And in a way, you represent the continuity of democracy in Sri Lanka. Um, you've seen so much. What lessons um, are to be learned from those phases to make sure that you, we don't go back there? And what is your plan of action if things don't go your way this, this time? There is nothing going my way or not going my way. It's for the people to decide what they want. I came here because no one else was willing to do this. I don't think we had that chance that ever happening in uh, India. People not wanting to be Prime Minister, not wanting to take over as President and give leadership. So question is, they don't want to do it then, how are they going to do it now? Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, well, thank you for joining us, Mr. President, and thank you for watching. Please watch the print for more such content.